Uh, welcome to the first session of our uh, uh, panelists. Uh, I will just very briefly, since um, both of our, um, uh, uh, Yujin, uh, Eugene Wang and uh, uh, Pao Sheng both gave actually a very detailed uh, and uh, exciting introduction. Uh, I don't really need to repeat a lot. Uh, uh, I uh, mainly will try to facilitate the discussion. Um, our, um, we'll begin by our uh, interlocutor, uh, uh, um, Yukio, who will uh, talk about some uh, of Harvard University. Um, um, he teaches uh, here in Japanese art. Uh, and um, he will um, um, raise some uh, questions for our panelists and then they will uh, respond and then we'll open our discussion to uh, the audience here. Um, just uh, briefly remind you who are in our um, panel from um, the uh, end of the table there, uh, Arnold Zhang or Zhang Hong, uh, who um, uh, born in New York, um, uh, learn Chinese uh, and Chinese culture uh, only uh, as uh, a uh, adult, uh, but um, uh, he has studied with uh, uh, Professor Cahill in Berkeley. He uh, studied with uh, C.C. Wong in his painting. He worked for uh, Sotheby's uh, for, as a vice president uh, for many years, uh, so eventually uh, started to um, devote his full time to uh, painting. Um, uh, Li Huayi, um, uh, born in Shanghai in 1948, and he now resides in San Francisco. Um, he was um, uh, studied in Shanghai with, with Zhang, uh, Zhang Zhongren, and then later uh, San Francisco Institute of Art. So we have someone who's educated both in China and in the United States, and he also now uh, divides his time between San Francisco and uh, uh, Beijing. And then um, we have um, uh, Chiu Ting, who sits in the middle of the two, uh, who is our youngest uh, panelist, uh, born in 1971 in Guangdong uh, province, now residing in Beijing. And um, he graduated uh, in the Academy of Arts and Design in Tsinghua University, Beijing, uh, which is also interesting because that university had been relegated to only um, uh, being a uh, technology, science and technology institute after 1949, but during the reform years eventually uh, started to um, uh, be expanded and um, recover all of its uh, humanities and arts uh, uh, departments um, after uh, uh, reforms. Uh, what's interesting about uh, Chiu Ting, of course, is his uh, PhD degree uh, jointly um, being uh, both scholarship and uh, his own uh, painting um, very much in line with uh, many of the traditional Chinese uh, uh, painters who are connoisseurs, collectors, art critics uh, in their own right. So his very um, existence in his training uh, in his degree, uh, in fact, ad acknowledges these multiple roles. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to our interlocutor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hinton. I uh, would like to uh, start off with just providing, again, a few visual uh, cues to uh, the audience to reintroduce uh, some of the contributions of these artists to the exhibition for those of you who haven't actually been able to see the exhibition. Then what I'd like to do is, um, by way of uh, providing a venue for the artists to speak about their work and to uh, engage in discuss, uh, larger discussions that are thematized by the exhibition and also to engage with the audience, I have a few uh, keywords that I'd like to ask the artists to respond to. Those keywords, uh, which are four in number, are gesture, which is the title of the panel, scale, the museum, and the bubble. Um, <clears throat> before, before beginning, I'd just like to, again, reintroduce our are uh, artists for the panel, and um, they contributed remarkable uh, moving works, which I think, as you'll agree, are saturated with historical consciousness. Uh, these uh, three painters at the table uh, participate, uh, uh, as Eugene Wong said, there's something known as the ink paradigm, which this exhibition presupposes, but these three artists are really ink painters uh, as well. 
And um, they're also very, very knowledgeable about history, about Chinese painting history. And that's something that we've uh, kept in mind in uh, devising and uh, engineering this discussion. And as you've seen, uh, Arnold Zhang, who is here uh, shown uh, kind of in an encounter with Jackson Pollock's number 10, which uh, if you see the exhibition is remarkably displayed not on a wall, but laid flat on a table uh, so that it engages, so that it, um, it uh, basically presupposes a mode of viewership, uh, spectatorship, which also parallels the process by which Pollock uh, painted this work and responded with secluded valley in the cold mountains, which you see here, and which, of which I show a uh, close up here so that you can get a, a sense of, uh, a little bit of a sense of some of the uh, virtu virtuosic brushwork and ink work um, uh, with which it's composed. And I'd like to linger on these details uh, a little bit, but I want to also introduce the work of Li Huayi, who's uh, remarkable work is not just on display at the MFA. I should also add that our uh, curator of Chinese art, Robert Maori, has uh, put on display uh, Harvard's own Li Huayi piece in the Sackler Museum on the second floor in a kind of uh, parallel exhibition which uh, complements what's at the MFA. And uh, here you see again, as Hao Sheng said, he responds to Chen Rong's Nine Dragons by uh, producing a remarkable work uh, in which um, replicating the splashed ink tradition in China from the mid Tang period uh, allows uh, ink, the unpremeditated mark to guide the imagination and then the completion of a landscape. So you have the completed landscape with its very um, uh, 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 descriptive, meticulous brushwork uh, in a central scroll, but this is again something that comes out of a much more uh, controlled accident in the application of, of um, ink on paper, which is represented in an earlier stage, kind of frozen in amber for us in the, in the seven panels behind the painting. And then we have uh, Cho Ting's work. Here you see him uh, in his uh, study visited by Hao Sheng and others. And he has chosen uh, this work by Zhao Ling Rong in the MFA. And of course, Zhao Ling Rong is uh, uh, well known for his Xiao Jing or small scenes, intimate landscape. Uh, works and this is a work to which Cho Ting responded with this remarkable visit to the eight great sites. Another hand scroll again in monochrome ink, which demonstrates a remarkable, I think, panorama of brushwork associated with classical Chinese painting traditions, and is also something that's born of his plein air approach, his approach to painting uh, outdoors. So this is something that I, uh, just as something of a visual, again, introduction to uh, the discussion that's about to take place. And actually, if we could have the lights uh, turn back on uh, uh, while I uh, ask our art artists to respond. And, um, and possibly also our chair, uh, Karma Hinton, uh, after they've responded. Okay, the first key word is gesture. And, um, the reason why this is chosen as a keyword is because uh, the exhibition seems to set up a direct encounter between the artist and something like a classical Chinese painting tradition. Um, but in fact, uh, I would argue that their response to this is of course already thoroughly mediated and thoroughly mediated by specifically Euro-American uh, modernity. And one way of thinking about this mediation is through the word gesture because it's uh, in a very schematic way, one might say that gesture is absent from a classical, uh, uh, Euro, uh, classical European pictorialism in the sense that uh, oil painting is an erasive medium. Uh, it hides uh, gesture and brushwork and that once you recognize gesture or brushwork, once it's foregrounded in a painting, then you have the emergence of modernity from the mid 19th century onward. So gesture is something that is seen as a departure from tradition in the European context. This is a bit schematic, but for the sake of discussion, let us posit this as a provisional formulation. On the other hand, gesture is foregrounded as a very important index of the artist, the self subjectivity uh, in Chinese painting from very early on. And um, uh, uh, if so, then this is a word which covers a very antithetical conception of Chinese painting traditions versus uh, Western painting traditions, but already in modernity, we have a discovery of the association between gesture and the self. Um, and isn't there a way in which uh, 
gesture is uh, a thoroughly, uh, is a portal for thinking about Chinese painting traditions from which we can escape. In other words, we have a modernist association of gesture with the self, which we're opposing back upon a Chinese painting tradition, which is somewhat more complex and uh, 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 diverse in this regard. And in this regard, I'd like to point out Arnold Zhang is very, un, uh, I think, very clear about his indebtedness to Euro-American modernity and his choice of Pollock foregrounds this. Uh, Li Huayi has extensive training in San Francisco and to some extent uh, has um, a very, uh, a very, uh, if you will, classically modern training as a painter. And Chiu Ting even in his use of plenarism which is something very closely associated with Impressionists and with uh, European Beaux-Arts Academy training, which of course served, formed uh, a very important foundation for Chinese academic training, out of which Chiu Ting emerges. Uh, so gesture is a key word that I'd like to ask our, our, uh, our panelists to respond to, and Arnold is already raising no, his hand, so I'd I like just to want to say one thing. Um, in preparation, speak into the in, in preparation for the, this little talk, I, I obviously read what what uh, we what the topics were going to be, and the first the first uh, problem I came across is when I saw the word gesture, I thought, well, how do you translate that into Chinese? So I would like to know from the translators or for anybody else, what is the word that you're using uh, to 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 translate this this term gesture, which. Uh, you're saying is so much uh, a, cru a crucial part of the Chinese thinking. I don't. I can't even come up with the right word. Uh, Anybody? How and how and Eugene? Would you like to to re respond here? Well, the, uh, this is really much, very much a problem of translation. Yeah. That's a wonderful yeah. first response. Yeah. <laughs> Lost in translation. It's in show yeah. 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 I, I've attempted uh, a number of translations quickly because uh, I, I had the same uh, uh, reaction. Uh, uh, or or the other shi, but qi shi the shi, momentum. Uh, but I think, um, uh, but I think it also has a sense of biao shi and biao da, and then it eventually gets into expression. No, you, you, do you think that's no, uh, not getting anywhere close to that, at all? <laughs> Well, I, I, the interesting yeah. thing is I can understand the concept, but there isn't a, a single term that yeah. <coughs> correlates quite the same. There, I think. Yeah. And when you're talking about hiding or uh, having or not having brushwork uh, being sort of shown as an, as an expression, uh, that definitely has... Um, well, to, yeah. to, uh, in defense of Hugh's uh, concept, uh, I think it's, we are in a situation like anthropologists, there are certain terms And then it's just as valid to, for the anthropologists as observers, as ethnographers mm -hmm. of that culture from outside to create a valid term mm -hmm. to describe certain phenomena that uh, the term may not be internal to the. To no, that's the, uh, absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. It's just when, when my colleague here writes a great big question mark. Saying, what are they talking yeah. about? I think no, 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 no. Yeah, we, yeah. I think we, that's that, then yeah. you know that uh, yeah. we've got to straighten yeah. this out first. I yeah. But I think we have a spectrum of translation for that because you can talk about sure, you can also perhaps eventually uh, be more specific about it uh, mm -hmm. because the specifics of it had to do with brushwork. Uh, whether one, whether brush uh, and ink or paint right. um, somehow yeah. applied somewhat independently of the subject matter being portrayed, uh, and that uh, somewhat in independently or have nothing to do with the subject matter. Mm -hmm. I think that was inherent in <coughs> part of your, uh, your mm -hmm. description of a gesture. So I think uh, at least we, for, for, for uh, a translation, we must perhaps include the, 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 the 表示表达, uh, 
uh, kind of uh, specific meaning uh, as well as the mm -hmm. other shi meaning qi shi de shi huo de shi qi po zhe yang de yi zhong dong xi. Well, we, we should also add that gesture is a very ambiguous concept in English too and in the, the modernist context, uh, the Euro-American modernity. And uh, it already presupposes, uh, kind of collates many different acts of art making. And uh, we could, that could be interpreted, for better or for worse, gesture is something that I would propose is a, uh, it mediates a kind of modernist understanding of Chinese painting tradition. So we could say something like brushstroke, which would actually uh, very forcefully, um, although it's not quite commensurate, but I think it does, it serves the same purpose in mediating uh, these these two perceived traditions. So why don't we, uh, uh, why don't we, as an, an exercise, change the word to brushstroke and ask all uh, three of you to it's respond? Very, well, it's, it, you have this, uh, it's, it's interesting because you have a kind of opposite problem where Chinese painters are always talking about something called bi mo, which is brush and ink, literally. But when you translate it into English, you 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 kind of lose lose yes. the flavor and yes. the importance of of that of that yes. term. Yes. But yes, mm. something like that. Ink painting is really <laughs> is is really ink water painting if translated into English, where right. the, the watery component is just as important. But, uh. but having said that, uh, I think uh, the the point is uh, certainly with my work, um, it's it's very much to the point because I grew up in the in the sixties and seventies uh, in New York City and and uh, spent a lot of time looking at uh, abstract expressionism and all kinds of modern painting. Uh, contemporary art in, in all of the museums, MoMA and Guggenheim and so on and so forth. And it really was because of that, my, my early exposure to non-objective uh, art, abstract art, all different kinds of, 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 of art in, in, that was popular in, in that period, that it predisposed me to understand Chinese ink painting in a little bit different way than, say, somebody who had been brought up uh, in the 18th century or 19th century in Europe. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, your, your point is definitely well taken. Thank you. Chiu uh, Ting or Li Huayi, would you like to uh, <laughs> respond? <laughs> yeah, I, I heard somebody you know, in the audience said uh, this is a bi fa. I think this is also uh, like Eugene said, a si. I think it's a very, very, very suitable. Because you know, I think um, the gesture not only um, physical experience, also, uh, like uh, Arnold Chan said, mm -hmm. it's, it's a you know express on the paper on the paper surface. You can see the water uh, ink mingling with brush touch. <laughs> Thank you. So, what about this relationship between? So we have Chiu. Oh yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Chiu Ting. Uh, Chiu Ting, um, uh, can you explain? I think this question also makes me think of some things. It makes me think of first of all. 刚才听了张先生李先生包括教授说的我想起了就是可能有一个词是非常能够表达出来的就是笔中张院远在他的历代名画记他在阐述中国的这个绘画的这个笔的用笔的问题他是用一个叫笔中这个中就是中迹跟
of um, uh, any kind of um, um, representational subject matter and the uh, and the the brushwork, the the interplay of uh, sort of the energy and the paint and the whatever becomes sort of the subject matter itself. So the the uh, the, the brushwork is the subject rather than uh, uh, the uh, brushwork in uh, service uh, to uh, some other uh, objective. Uh, so uh, that's mm -hmm. basically, uh, but I think in China, uh, it was always a tension, that, you know, long, long history of this tension, whether the, br the brushwork, uh, you know, perhaps at some periods served the depiction purpose uh, a little more closely, and other periods uh, went way far swung the other way. Uh, I think in Chinese history, there's also a pendulum back and forth and with different artists, but I think th the tension of the brushwork being a service to something else and being its an expressive means in its own right uh, had always sort of uh, been there. So that um, uh, we're, we're talking about, uh, um, again, the, the notion of uh, something that seems uh, as modernity as, uh, as um, uh, in one culture maybe tradition in another. Uh, I think that's uh, something to, to uh, keep in mind and certainly when we talk about modernity, uh, it's already become a word that is coined for a particular way of seeing and a particular kind of art. It no longer has a um, uh, sort of a word. When, when people who lived in those times, modern means their own time. So we lost modernity as a word to uh, describe, you know, just like uh, <laughs> uh, brushwork. Uh, it no longer describes the actual time in which people live. It describes a particular approach to art. So today, we have to invent a new word, uh, contemporary. Uh, but 50 years later, um, every, uh, you know, next day, we're still, you know, 10 years later, people are still mm. contemporary. So is contemporary becoming uh, a, some kind of a, a word to designate a particular approach? Or does contemporary, can it then, uh, since the approaches have uh, diverted, you know, so far, can contemporary then be a word to describe whatever is current, uh, the living people doing living things, engaging in various ways with what has come before them. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I would, uh, w I think this is a very rich uh, vector of, of discussion which we can take up again in, in a little bit later uh, when we open up the discussion. I guess I would disagree in the sense that uh, modernity isn't a choice, an interpretive choice that we can bring to these works, but it's a fact that has happened. We cannot, uh, we cannot avoid modernity as fund, Euro-American modernity specifically has fundamentally conditioned the works of our fellow artists to such a degree that it's something that has to, that thoroughly mediates this work. So I would, I would argue that modernity is kind of uh, not, not, not an option which needs to be dismissed, but a fact that we have yet to fully um, kind of analy analytically uh, come to terms with in the works uh, of these artists. But I think we, I would like to go to the second um, keyword here and ask uh, our, res uh, our panelists to respond in kind, and that is the word scale. Um, if we can say that many uh, types of Chinese painting, classical Chinese painting, presuppose intimate scales of viewership, viewership by one person or several people, um, I think that's really brought to the fore in the, the works that were chosen by our panelists who all chose horizontal hand scrolls uh, from the, the excuse me, two of which so, chose horizontal hand scrolls from the collection of a certain intimacy. Uh, Arnold Zhang, of course, chose Jackson Pollock's work and has an interesting relationship to scale. But in general terms, um, I would say that uh, both Li Huayi and Chiu Qing uh, enlarge the scale of their works from something that presupposes a private, intimate viewing space to something that presupposes a large public viewing space. And I was especially surprised by Qiu Ting's, the scale of his work, because he chose an intimate landscape scene, uh, Zhao Ling Rang, which is a very, very small, diminutive work. And your scroll was much, much larger. And somehow, I feel that uh, that uh, really changed the sense of the experience of the, the, the work that you were responding to. In the same way, uh, Li Huayi, although I think uh, he chose Chen Rung's, land, hand, lands, uh, uh, Chen Rung's Nine Dragons hand scroll and uh, 
fundamentally altered the sense of scale by creating this very large monumental uh, work. And we might even radically say that uh, there is no real public space for art viewing in classical Chinese uh, culture. You have spaces that are for one-on-one -on -one viewing, intimate gatherings, somewhat larger gatherings maybe in the palace, but nothing on the sense of the museum scale, the contemporary museum scale certainly. Uh, by the same token, Arnold, uh, Arnold Zhang has chosen a work that presupposes a public uh, viewership, a mid-century uh, New York art world viewership, and return that to the scale of the intimate Ming scholar's studio, the classical Chinese viewership. So I feel that scale is another important keyword that mediates your relationship to the works that you chose. Would you care to respond? Uh, that may be a very schematic formulation, but would you care to respond? Uh, any of you. And this, this of course brings up notions of public, public versus private spaces of, of what modes of spectatorship uh, we're talking about here. Um, actually, I think, you know, um, what I'm most interested in is Northern Song period painting. I think the monumentality of Chinese painting, which is, uh, um, I can say, you, you can see from this format, even on uh, not a huge, huge big like we did, crazy big, um, but still on um, it's, it's contained. I, I think like a Northern Song Dynasty painting, which is uh, hanging in the palace, um, is, is, uh, we, that's what we call the Miao Tang Zi Qi. It's a Gao Ju Miao Tang. Of course, it's not, not big like yes. we do. I don't know, maybe contemporary artists is more egoistic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and other things, um, I, I do this really uh, think about that. It, it, this, uh, this skill become, um, of course, I didn't realize everybody even bigger than me. I think, <laughs> I think you know, skill like this already become a public uh, art. Then uh, that's why I, I talked to on Sheng Hao so many times to, to try to do this kind of installation kind of thing. It's called installation, but what we talk about, it, just like I said, uh, when people, because the, the audience, uh, they enjoy Chinese painting, which is quite a difference from enjoying a, a Western painting. Uh, Western painting, you, you can you know, catch the impact in seconds, uh, or split seconds. The Chinese painting sometimes uh, require people, make people tranquilize them, make them uh, try, <laughs> what I'm doing this is <laughs> <laughs> and try anyways try you know let them uh, read out uh, have some meditation so I talked to Sheng Hao uh, can we have both um, kind of you know uh, provided to to our audience of course I, I'm not catering but anyway I think you know if you have split second to go through uh, the painting you can see the impact you see the simple stroke but if you do have the time uh, stay there, we provide a centerpiece which is like a meditation focus, more detailed. Well, that's design. wonderful because you define scale in terms of temporality, time, duration, right? So <laughs> the, you're bringing durational scale as a concept into this discussion, which I think is very interesting. Thought so. thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wait. Chiu Ting, maybe. Uh, I think the question is, is that the painting is very different. 比如我选择赵丽娘这块实际上就是说比如在这个宋画的这个公用上这种公共的公众性的比如给这个中书省啊这些电语啊画的这些作品像我们看传世的像郭熙的这种作品应该是这一类那么反映在郭熙身上
这个对应赵令然这个作品，我当然就是在画的时候，恰恰是就是在这个，呃，尺寸上，呃，扩大了很多，包括长度上是非常长的，因为确实这个怎么说抽象一点说就是，它涵盖了我的一个思古之情和求新之念，这这种复杂的一种，文化的一一一一种，一种情感吧，就是这样的一个。And we should also conf uh, add that Cho Ting only a fr only a small portion of your scroll is 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 on display. It's a much longer scroll. It's just only partially unrolled currently in the in the exhibition. Also. Uh, yes, Arnold. Yeah, I I would uh, like to say a, a word about not only scale but also format. Uh, when I had this idea that I would uh, uh, try to respond to a Jackson Pollock work. Um, first thing I did was to go on the uh, museum website to see which ja whether they had owned Jackson Pollock and which kinds they had. Turned out they only had two, as I, as, as I remember. One is an early vertical work, which is now up in the, in the, um, the new wing. Mm -hmm. And the other was this number 10, which 10 turns out to be a very, very good choice as well for, for this exhibition. Um, by the way, that painting, that particular painting, number 10, was one of the, f the few Chinese paintings uh, American paintings that went to China what, in 19, 1981. So it, it, it's actually quite fortuitous. That, that, that painting was actually seen in China in an exhibition. Uh, anyway, uh, so when I saw that, when I looked on the website and saw this horizontal work, I said, perfect. That to me is a hand scroll. <laughs> and plus, it looked to me, I, I, I can't help it uh, when even even when I see other Jackson Pollock works, before I was even thinking about this project, I tend to see landscape. So it, it seemed like the, the ideal choice for me. Now, the other thing I was going to mention, which may tie into your next theme of museums, is that uh, one of the problems we've had, uh, I, I feel, with, with the viewing Chinese paintings, particularly in the uh, uh, hand scroll format, is that uh, in, uh, in the past, especially, uh, I remember looking at photos of, of the old days in the Freer Gallery or whatever, where they basically would take the hand scroll, roll it out, and stick it on the wall flat, like as if it were a Western painting. And I, th I think, and also lit as if it were a Western painting, and I think it really doesn't do justice to the aesthetic that, uh, that the Song painters and the Yuan painters and the Ming painters had developed. So my idea, as you uh, pointed out perfectly, is that what I wanted to do in this case was to do the opposite, was to take the Jackson Pollock and scale it down. Uh, because we're used to see, it's not that large a painting, but we're used to seeing it on a wall, flat, with bright light on it, and, and the idea is to see it from a distance. And, uh, uh, you know, that's how I grew up looking at paintings, and, and uh, in, in the old days, that's how we looked at Chinese paintings as well. Now, in, in recent times, uh, curators have learned for a number of reasons. One, the light isn't so good to have bright lights on them, but also now we tend to see them in, in cases uh, nicely displayed at an angle, more, a little bit more like the experience of viewing a, a traditional hand scroll, which is meant to be looked at a section at a time and, and slowly, as you say, uh, it, it usually made for an individual or small group of, uh, of people, of viewers. So uh, what I wanted to do was, was uh, turn the tables a little bit and say, what if we put Jackson Pollock flat on a table uh, I was very surprised that the museum was, 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 would allow me to do that, in fact, and I'm, I'm pleased to see it. But uh, I've been walking around the exhibition, and, and when people go and look at the Pollock that way, it, it's actually very interesting, because usually you don't get to see it like that. Now, after all, that's the way it looked when he was painting it. So uh, that was another fun aspect, um, to, to uh, turn the tables and say, well, what, how, can we look at Western paintings it, what, what, if, what if things had been different and, 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 and uh, the Chinese had taken a bunch of Western paintings and brought them to their country and tried to display them uh, in their context? Uh, would it hold up? And I think w one, not only did I want people to look at my work and maybe see a little bit of reinterpreting you know, some of Pollock's gesture or whatever, but also to think about uh, Jackson Pollock in a different way because when you see it flat, in, in a not so bright space, it, it still holds up because great art is great art. Well, th th thank you for creating that bridge to uh, museums, Arnold. Uh, one thing, our next keyword museum did in fact want to bring up this sense of how uh, museum collections me mediate the work of all three, three uh, 
artists we have here. What one of the um, interesting things about museums is that in uh, in a European context, they have conditioned artistic production very heavily since at least the 18th century. And you think of the Louvre and how going to paint there on a Sunday was a very important part of Beaux Arts uh, uh, academic uh, training. Um, and if you think in in many Chinese contexts, you had private uh, uh, collections that artists had access to, and uh, you have uh, larger the larger imperial collections, which which mediated the production of of some court artists. But in general. Um, uh, all three of you have have um, responded specifically to a museum collection, that of the Museum of Fine Arts, which has, as Eugene Wang pointed out, a very specific uh, narrative of Chinese painting history. And uh, we wanted to ask, uh, to what extent, in this regard, you are responding to your own sense of a of, of Chinese painting traditions, and to what extent you're responding specifically to uh, the MFA collections, and more generally how museums really um, condition your, your uh, how you understand museums as conditioning your output in the present, which is of course a very big distinction from um, how artists worked in uh, the pre-modern era. Okay. No, uh, Anna, are you just, a, you know, just a quick. Uh, and you, you mentioned that you, you want to see, uh, you want to do the, uh, your, your hand scroll in traditional way mm -hmm. and, and look in the traditional way, right? But, uh, but uh, you know, back to we talk about the scale. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I think none of us do doing traditional uh, hand scroll. Just a so jian bu guo jian. Even, even gao tou da jian, uh, it will not, uh, you know, over the uh, 60 cent centimeter. So everybody now is right. <laughs> no more traditional hands. Right. I was just going to say, say pretty much the same thing, is that uh, I think the challenge for, for us as contemporary painters who still want to do things that are linked to tradition in this way, uh, it's actually very difficult because the audience, including ourselves, is used to seeing these hand scrolls completely unrolled. So when I, I do a hand scroll, uh, what I'm, I'm hoping, if I'm lucky enough and successful, is that one can view it the old way, <coughs> section at a time, maybe a foot or two feet at a time, back and forth, and it still works. And, but also very cognizant about the overall <laughs> impression that it makes when you unroll the thing, because I know, hopefully, uh, when it's displayed in a museum, which is fine with me, that it will hold up <laughs> that way as well. I mean, if you look, some, look at some of the, uh, the, the hand scrolls by the ancient masters, uh, which are, you know, in view, uh, we see them now all the time in museums, some of them really don't hold up that well as, ver as horizontal compositions, because they were really designed to be looked at a little bit at a time. And that's something I think that all of us are quite cognizant of uh, because we all, we all have that, share that museum experience. On the other hand, a project like this was so wonderful because the artists were invited up uh, individually and we got to look at the pieces in the museum in the old fashioned way in storage as, as opposed to seeing them just in the case. So we got the best of both worlds, even with the Pollock I was so fortunate because having decided to work on that painting, it turned out that it was on view and I made a trip up here and saw it on the wall. But then a few months later, Hal called me up and said, you know, it's in, it's in uh, the conservation lab if you want to see it. So I came up and got to see it flat, which is a very rare experience for Western painting. So we, we lucked out. <laughs> Thank you, Arne. You know, we, this is a very good opportunity for every single artist to can have a uh, they are, you know, the, the most favorite piece uh, was viewing in a private, uh, a quite private, uh, you know, space, and 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 uh, we we never, you know, for the for the Jiu for me, like uh, we never holding a, a, a such a southern song piece in in the hand, and when open open the the, the wrapping. You see the, the register, Su Ju Bao Ji, the register written by Zhang Zhao. <laughs> you know, uh, this is an incredible thing. Uh, no, no. That's one, it's, it's interesting, right? To make this project work, the museum had to uh, return you to, had to kind of um, stage 
a very private viewing experience, it, it carve it out of the modern public museum, so it kind of transports you back to something like how initial audiences would have viewed uh, these, these hand scrolls. Yes, and, and also Jiu Longzhu has another uh, small copy, which is the Xiu, Xiu Zhen Zhen. So it's like a Qian Rong holding it all the time. So this is kind of experience. We be treated like an emperor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Xiu Ting, would you like to? I don't know if I'm not sure about the question. I don't <笑>我们都不很清楚 <呃>, <笑>波士顿美术馆它是有它有一个特定的一个收藏历史它的藏品也是有一定它自己的一个特点所以你们在问说你们的这个回应气质或者一种品味包含着过去的一个经验我在画画的时候我应该起点非常高才对所以我是很慎重的他促使我更加慎重来对待我的这个手绢的一个创作这个延伸就是包含着我很多的一个想法中国人的一种山水自然的一种空间概念稍微解释一下平远的意思我们比如说许道宁的那个渔夫图平远呢
，所以它整个这个造很多平眼山水画，它的呈现，它的一种横线的切割，它是很明显的，所以它能够让你的精神很舒缓。所以实际上我们看很多山水师在讨论山水画的时候，很容易去选择以平眼的这种图示来入诗。就这种诗，我说的是因为有画才有这种诗的，所以我觉得就是平眼恰恰是能够非常吻合中国的文人他的一种审美和表现的形形，它能够让你精神非常的放松，非常的这种呃超然吧，能够给你一种精神的引渡，这个就是相对于高远和深远，它更能呈现。但我刚一开始说的就是像很多山水，包括像。李李这个范宽的《西山行》里这种典型的，我们说是高眼的，包括郭熙的这种《早春图》，实际上它都是三眼兼备。我们看到它有高眼的一种伟伟岸的形象，那种气势，但实际上它里面透进去的，它恰恰是深远和平远，给它塑造出一种非常丰满的空间的感受。Well, thank you. I mean, it really. Uh... Chiu Ting, your explanation really shows how uh, scale is really tied in to uh, picture making format and the museum question in a very uh, fundamental way. And I think we may have more questions on the, in this regard, but I'd like to ask uh, uh, Karma Hinton. Karma, do you have any thoughts on this uh, question specifically of the, uh, of the scale or the museum in in Freshing? Um, I don't think I have uh, much uh, intelligent things to say about this, but uh, I often wonder how um, uh, these, uh, especially long traditional scrolls, uh, um, in their display in the museum, uh, it, it does present a very frustrating uh, dilemma that, uh, that they were supposed, they're meant for uh, being viewed in a more intimate setting, uh, section by section, uh, and then uh, when they're um, uh, completely unrolled, uh, in a, if the museum uh, has the long, long, long cabinet to do so, uh, it sort of loses part of its uh, kind of traditional viewing meaning. But if, uh, if you don't do it that way, uh, for people who only visit a museum once or twice, uh, uh, you, you know, seeing only one section is also not doing justice to the painting. So uh, it is a, um, a, a dilemma. Um, perhaps film. <laughs> Many paintings now have, uh, you know, you can scroll it back and forth, but that's, of course, you're not looking at the original. That's already uh, a representation. So um, uh, this also, I think, presents uh, some kind of uh, um, challenge, as uh, Arnold had said, that um, for, um, uh, after all, the museum itself is a, is a, is a modern <laughs> concept. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Euro European paintings uh, were, m besides uh, being viewed in the church, which is perhaps much more public uh, in the olden days, uh, also was in the courts, uh, where it's Chinese painting, uh, uh, literati, uh, you know, like-minded, high-minded people shared that, and then palace painting, you know, it's the private uh, viewing privilege of the emperor or the high officials. So. Um, there, there is this, uh, how do we um, uh, proceed from <laughs> all of these traditions uh, and, and bring especially the kind of Chinese format mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, particular sensibilities of Chinese painting uh, to uh, face uh, a general modern viewing public and how does that viewing uh, maybe affect the public? Uh, uh, what does that m maybe teach them? Um, uh, how do that uh, uh, give them uh, a different view of perhaps the modern, the contemporary, the future existence. Oh, and your comments underscore the fact that there's also a difference between making and reception, right? We yes. can, the maker, the artists here, can experience the works at the scale that they make them, at, the, at, at something like their natural scale and format and the natural relationship of the body of the maker to the work of art, but we don't have a means in modern public museum culture to recreate the reception side of that, uh, of that, of that sense of, of scale. Because you wouldn't so be able to afford to have someone handle your painting a lot. So that's it. Well, the, the video. What's that? The, yeah, that's what I just mentioned, uh, but yeah. <laughs> But video is completely disembodied, Professor Fong. No, it's <laughs> you know, we as art historians can, can understand that there are various ways of looking at things. 
looking at things. So very importantly to have a museum. Uh, I'm keenly aware of this because I feel, in fact, a museum as you and I know it is a very much about not only modern, but an American <laughs> creation. China has all great works of art. They're in the palace collection. Every time they dig five feet into the ground, they find something, archaeologists take over, the government gets excited, build another museum, <laughs> and then the keepers, or some middle-aged uh, person, <laughs> gets hold of a key, says, well, my responsibility is to protect them, so even the, even, even, even the even experts cannot see them. Yes. Now, so here comes the modern museum, which I really feel, from my own experience, thinking back, is very much of an, of an American uh, institution. In that, we have museum uh, display curators writing labels to explain, which is something, when I first encountered this, just boggled my mind. It never, never happened that way before. Well, that's another dimension of this museum question, right? Not only how does it affect art making, but also art history. And, well, uh, therefore, uh, well, let's say, in China, what they want to do now, uh, let's say Zheng Zhonghuang. They are building a museum, museum What is that? Museum <laughs> Zhongxing is really, uh, the, the, the aim, of course, is economic to get tourists. But in order to uh, make the, all the caves, all the paintings, all the art history available, they use technology to digitize everything. So Frank Ying Su, the director, came to see us talk about it. I said, well, then, in order to explain this to the tourist viewer. You have to have a script. There has to be a discourse. The art historians have to say, you know, this is what we are seeing, whether it's history or uh, foreign influence and development, all these things. And so it leads to not only explanation mm -hmm. parts, oh. Oh. Uh, it, it, le it leads to uh, writing labels now, in Chinese museums right now, if they have museums at all, they don't work very well because everything coming out of the storage, well, at, at most there is a, just, a, they say, attributed to somebody, and that's the end of it. No one writes labels. Now, if we, all the students here, scholars here, write labels, but also the modern technology, you can make, make a video. There's a, there's a script. Well, and I'm saying you have to have a script like writing a script, uh, uh, like writing a movie. You, you have to have an Alfred Arthur Hitchcock, first of all, to learn how to see things. Well, Professor Fong, let me ask you, uh, regarding this idea of script or narrative, uh, actually, let me ask, let me ask our artists, and our, this relates to our last keyword, which is, uh, which is bubble, which is something that I think is going to elicit a lot of conversation, uh, a lot of discussion amongst our audience members. Um, uh, but the reason why we chose bubble is because uh, b bubble as in Chinese art bubble. Uh, right now, uh, we're in a very interesting situation in contemporary art in which most contexts for contemporary art making in the world are experiencing something like a post-bubble syndrome, where uh, in, uh, with, with econ under uh, conditions of, of, uh, in an economic downturn, uh, artistic communities of, of artists are starting to turn to things like do-it-yourself culture, are much more conscious of a kind of um, the use of recyclable materials and a kind of critique of wanton consumption, which characterized the bubble period and also characterized a certain kind of art making during uh, the bubble period. And I would say that Japan, which is a context I'm much more familiar with, most familiar with, is uh, exemplary of this, in which there's a critique now of the Murakami Takashi paradigm for for art making, which really was very bubbly, to, uh, to choose a word. But what's interesting, I think, about this exhibition and the artists that we have here is that you 
you, your work uh, seems to me very unconditioned by larger economic forces in that you were always pursuing very um, interesting uh, uh, para-classical uh, forms of art making. And so I wanted to ask, and in, in general, I think we could say this for the artists in the exhibition itself. So I wanted to ask you, what is your conscious, and the, the Chinese art world is an exception to the DIY, do-it-yourself culture post-bubble syndrome, because it's very much still in a, in, within a bubble. China itself is in a bubble economy, and uh, no one likes to talk about it, but no one liked to talk about a bubble bursting when America was in the throes of its uh, economic, uh, you know, um, um, kind of uh, a period, a period of high economic growth in Japan in the 80s and so forth. But I just wanted to ask, what is your consciousness of what's going on around you in the l larger Chinese art sphere under these conditions of a, of a bubble market in which people are really speculating and driving up prices beyond the worth of the art itself? And does that in any way uh, shape your understanding of what your contemporaries are doing um, given the modes of art that you <coughs> practice? Any, anybody uh, care to respond? Well, I think most of you know that I, I grew up in the Chinese art market, as it were, uh, working for Sotheby's and then working for Kaikado in New York. Uh, so I've been in the auction business and the, the uh, dealer business, gallery business. And I think in some ways it's been very helpful to me as an artist to have uh, kind of uh, grown up within the market first to understand that the, the, the market has a, a, takes on a life of its own and I've seen o over the years uh, the ups and downs and I've seen artists who were very popular suddenly disappear from from the radar uh, and uh, so basically it, it, having this kind of knowledge that that, that price and uh, popularity are not n are no guarantee of uh, uh, kind of a, lo a long-term existence and, and, and really are not a to totally a measure of artistic quality. I think that's actually been very useful for me, so I don't, I don't have to think about that. I've, I've just been doing my own work, and it's very funny. I've, I'm still I'm doing this kind of stuff I've been doing all along, and, you know, who would have thought that when I was started painting at 15 that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, 40, 40 years later I would have a work in the... Museum of Fine Arts Boston, a, chi a traditional Chinese painting, which in, in when I started painting, nobody cared. You know, so, uh, yeah, so my answer is that uh, I, I'm watching with, with great interest the uh, contemporary Chinese art market, but it, it really has nothing to do with me. And it, your, your, <laughs> your exposure to the inner mechanics of the market have really, in some ways, really m made you be able, uh, allowed you to transcend. I, I think it's I insulated me from, mm -hmm. from, from the actual work, mm -hmm. or Thank something you. like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really worry about the market. Uh, the market will take care of itself. Uh, and I think, in general, a lot of things that are popular at the time uh, don't, don't stand the test of time. Thank you. Any of our two remaining <laughs> fellow panelists here? <today? laughs> We're think, aiming uh, to make them feel uncomfortable. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I think uh, what I Arno said, you know, or not only for himself, also for me. Like, uh, you know, we, we, we. I just close the window. You know, I, I don't know really what what happened. Uh, <laughs> really, and and uh, you, you, you can see in, in my painting, even there is no one house and then no one person there. You know, I, I'm somewhere way out <laughs> there. So, so I, I think, you know, of course, uh, you know, I, I know he knowing, uh, I, know, I, I have to say, you knowing marketing, right? So maybe you, you will have this conscious how to avoid this uh, problem. <laughs> But I even don't, <laughs> I don't, don't know the mar marketing, thing, really, really. So, so I think, you know, I think, um, uh, yeah, m my experience, like life always up and down, you know, but, uh, you know, who knows? <laughs> but I, I will say one, one, one uh, specific thing as a market observer is that uh, if we do look at the, the uh, the so-called Chinese art market, particularly the contemporary Chinese art market as it's developed over the last decade or so, 
I think it, it's fair to say that the one area that really hasn't been inflated is, is contemporary ink mm -hmm. in relation to other things. Yeah. That, that's the reason you, you stay in the ink field. <laughs> <laughs>秋婷你有没有要说的呃我前段时间中国嘉德在拍卖我碰碰到张红先生嗯 <笑> 可能他也有收藏，我也有有去拍卖收藏，但是很难买。这个只是说作为我们喜欢这个东西，我们呃，very <笑> difficult now。但对我们画画确实像这个李先生他们说的，对我们没有影响，我们关注的还是自己画画本身的问题。呃，我也不大去关注这个所谓的我们说的这时代的样式、时代的风格。我觉得我更关注的是我如何能够非常深入细微的把这种我对自然对造化的这种体认表现出来这个是我觉得是我最核心的一个理念我邱先生你是在大学里教书的对吧那你你是有公职的人<笑> 整个那个学院的学院里面的情况你觉得学院里面的艺术家有什么样的或者学生啊研究生啊他们对这个环境就是这个 但是现在好像我觉得，因为文化它本身是多样化的，所以就是可能各选各的吧，也各种状态。我觉得都很正常，因为任何时代都有它的泡沫。这个这不是说现在才有泡沫，我想任何一个时代都会有。呃，感叹
you know, typically what I do is, uh, you know, do these these landscape paintings, Chinese landscape painting, in the kind of the old literati, old old fashioned way. And a lot of what we do is based on uh, reinterpreting the, the the spirit or the style of the ancient master. And I, I thought in this case, because we're dealing with a, mo a modern American audience primarily, uh, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about uh, about Chinese painting and how it's you know based on when you see label saying uh, landscape in the style of Wang Meng or landscape in the style of so-and-so. I think Westerners have a, a, a misconception that that means that you're just kind of copying or uh, it's totally derivative. So I wanted to point out uh, in, in my own way that uh, when we do a work in the, that's based or is, is in the style of an ancient master that the, the really the important thing is to take the model digest it and transform it in some ways. So I figured if I took a, a Song painting or Yuan painting, uh, and there's some great works that I could have chosen in the collection, and, and done my usual uh, turn it into a Zhang Hong, turn it into an Arnold Chang painting, that's, that uh, I think it, would, it wouldn't have, it, for the people who know what I'm doing, they'd understand. But for, for, the, for the newer audience, they wouldn't really realize <coughs> Uh, what, what what I was doing, uh, what, where the transformation was. So I thought if I took something totally different, like an abstract painting, and turned it into a landscape, that 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 is that would help people to kind of understand the way that Chinese artists traditionally uh, learn from the past, and it for, worked perfectly into the theme of the show, which in English is freshing, but in Chinese, uh, the title is uh, using the past to as a, as a teacher. about the previous discussion on uh, scale and also bubble. Uh, as for bubble, I was thinking, um, just like we say art always enjoys the fortune of its time, um, it's really the fortune of China. Um, the, the Kyo calls it a bubble that uh, allow us to have this exhibition of fresh ink. And uh, especially it's poignant to think that when the American wing was opening uh, and the, the American history was being acknowledged and celebrated. Fresh Ink is contemplating China's future in its relationship with its past. And uh, um, as for scale, um, I think the artists actually came up a very, a very, uh, quite a successful way to resolve this problem of uh, having a hand scroll laying out um, to have, with the possibility of being viewed in one glance but still forcing people to see the details, which is by enlarging it. Um, when you have hand scrolls that's this tall and 10 meters long, or even longer, in Choting's case, 15 meters, um, it forces the audience to walk from one end to another and uh, see one section at a time. And uh, uh, in fact, one glance couldn't encompass it. And not to talk shop, I was actually uh, thinking about another possibility, and I want to bring it to our museum professionals to see if it could be done, which is um, there is a kind of glass that you can only look through when you face it straight on. I forgot what's it called. And if you look to the side, it becomes foggy. And if we can uh, cover the case with that kind of glass, maybe it will work for even Chinese hand scrolls. <laughs> um, I just have a brief comment on that, uh, that um, uh, uh, are we um, somewhat um, limiting this show if we say that this show is actually contemplating China's future? Because uh, I think there is much to teach uh, and much to um, learn um, in terms of even, because these are, after all, uh, you, you can't even really define uh, the artist necessarily as, uh, as Chinese anymore. Uh, I think this cross, uh, 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 crossing the border uh, and uh, also, uh, what I'm thinking about has to do with um, uh, the, the uh, public uh, display of art and doing art for one's own pleasure and one's own cultivation. Uh, certainly, uh, the, the litera literati tradition uh, may have been exaggerated as it's only that and the people never interested in money or whatever, but still there is a kernel of somehow art being very much part of, an integral part of life. Uh, I encounter this in my teaching uh, when I teach uh, students in a freshman class. Uh, it's not even an uh, art history class. It's called Reading the Arts. 
um, uh, I invited Arnold and uh, uh, Michael Tierney to my class to talk to the students and some of the students say, why do you do this? And Arnold said, I love it. And the students are, st you know, are, are starry eyed. So you know, we, it, it's, is it um, just for display? Uh, certainly we need exhibitions, we need museums, we need the art market to enable some people to uh, be able to uh, maybe uh, have enough money just to paint and not do anything else. But for what about everybody else who has to do everything else? Uh, can art be part of their lives uh, besides spectating? Uh, I think it's, it's important uh, um, a way to, to, to think about art and I think uh, this kind of exhibition uh, has much to, to teach about. Uh, about that. Uh, uh, in the recent review by uh, David Wallace Wells uh, in Newsweek uh, of this current um, as abstract expressionist uh, show, he sort of, uh, uh, um, from retrospect, looked at the history of abstract uh, expressionism. I mean, the title is interesting. It says uh, Splatter, Day, uh, Splatter Day Saints. Uh, so, um, <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, yeah, we look at these people as gods, as, as uh, somehow and they made tremendous claims about their art as the end of all art and their, you know, the, 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 the beacon of democracy and all of that, very, you know, political and hyperbole. But what is this uh, art engaging in everyday life uh, of, of an individual person? Uh, that's what I'm raising. More questions, right. Oh, back there. Um, my comment sort of continues on from what Karma Hinton has just been saying. I think what we're seeing in addressing all of these different issues is that there has gotten to be a bigger distance between the artist and the audience. And the fact that um, in this exhibition there are 10 artists working in uh, different modes and reaction to different things uh, shows that there's such a diversity of creative methods that we can't really expect a single person to be uh, kind of directly connected to the artist's personal artistic sense of all of them. And the fact that everybody is creating larger works also hints at the disappearance of the intimate distance between artist and audience. And I think in a way it's, it's too bad that that has disappeared and it would be interesting if, um, if artists would try making smaller works designed for a uh, kind of intimate encounter between artist and uh, audience or between two viewers um, to sort of return to that social sharing of an aesthetic interest that um, was one of the original motivations for some of the earlier paintings. Um, and. and uh, you know, the museum has really put a big distance between the artist and the audience. They, uh, the artists rarely know who is seeing their work and millions of people may see it and they'll never know about it. Uh, can I just mention one thing? I had hoped that uh, in my initial conception of this, uh, this project, I had hoped that there would be some way to, to force, to, to, to exhibit my hand scroll in a way that it forced people to look at it from a very, uh, in an intimate setting, like you know, only only having space for uh, two or three people to view it at a time. But you know, when once you get into a museum context, you have all kinds of other considerations, like wheelchair access and and all kinds of things they have to take into account. So, you know, I, I think given the circumstances, they 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 really did a terrific job. But I know what you're saying. If if there was a way to recreate that experience uh, for people just looking quietly by themselves at an at a individual work, it would be wonderful. Um, okay, I'll have a gentleman back, uh, yeah, in the back row there. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment uh, about the, this bubble concept from the perspective of a collector. Uh, I've been collecting Chinese paintings since the mid-90s, and I think Ar Arnold can attest to this, that probably back in the mid-90s, the most expensive Chinese painting in an auction would s probably have been $1 million when in the Western art, it would have been 80 million. So the likelihood that the greatest creativity of China was worth 1 80th of the value of Western art was probably pretty unlikely. Now you go 15 years later, 
there's now as many millionaires in China as there are in the U.S., even though there's three times the population. And now there are paintings that are selling for 30 or 40 million dollars when the most expensive Western art is 180 million. So I'm not quite sure I would define that as a bubble until maybe some people who are collecting art would want to buy it and then maybe burn it when they were buried, as happened in Japan in the late 80s. <laughs> I have a hand there in the back. Um. This is a kind of unrelated question to anything that's come up so far, but something I'm very curious about. And that is if you can speak to the relationship that you have with the scroll makers. With the uh, w wondering the mounters? If, Are you if talking about the one of people who the mount the painting? The mm -hmm how they're chosen and how the working relationship is. Yeah. 因为就是可能讨论所以我原先有一个比较小的手绢让它做完之后再根据那个手绢的一些情况进行一些局部的改进做成现在这个样子这是我个人的一个话 Anyone else has a comment on that? I, I have a big problem for, for the mounting. Uh, and I talked to Sun uh, Hao over the time, because I, I did the computer. I asked somebody did the computer visibility how to uh, you know, install the, the whole thing. So I have panel behind it. So uh, it, it, you know, <laughs> it didn't take a big trouble make the curve of the wall. Then uh, this mounting, which is I, I use, um, Pretty much, uh, you know, uh, something you know. We have in the Song Dynasty. Think about the, uh, when when Song Dynasty uh, artists have painted on the silk, they have to make an inner frame first, then you know, stretch the, the just like a canvas, stretch the silk uh, over the, the the inner frame. Then I use this way make my seven panels first. Then the one biggest problem is the middle piece. Because the form of the middle piece, uh, Chinese called the tongjing. Uh, that means I don't want the right side and left side uh, this, this uh, uh, margin. I, I just want to connect with uh, my, my panel. So for mounting this, um, most Chinese mounters, they don't want to do that. Because you know they have to um, enforce the, the aid. Your, uh, we, we call the middle rear painting called uh, the painting mounting, basically like, like uh, wear a, a clothes. So like before, like Arnold want judge a painting first to, to see uh, the kids is from what kind of level family, what a mountain it is. It's a good mountain or, or bad mountain, what, what clothes they are wearing, <laughs> what, is he, what is he doing. And then, you know, I, I, then I, they, because, you know, if, the, the middle piece, we call the Hua Xing, is it go to the edge, will damage it. So everybody will want to leave some space there, the margin there. And we Tong Jing, actually we, we don't want that. Just go, go right edge. So for this um, Japanese way, is put a string 
on the edge and I turned the paper back. And uh, of course, this is a very good way. But the bad thing is um, Japanese mounting. I'm, I'm not saying something bad. But <laughs> ba ja Japanese mounting, the back paper, which is different from a Chinese mounting, they they missing last procedure. We call the ya. 然后把那个石头把那个背, uh, the back of the paper polish it. So when you roll it up, you open it, uh, you never hurt the, the surface of repainting. And the Japanese uh, always don't do that. So you, you, you know, it's from the Chinese thinking will be, you know, have, have the, the, the rubbing, then we, we damage the, the, the painting. So finally, we sent a piece to the, uh, there is one person in Taipei Palace Museum. He can do uh, the Japanese way edge plus Chinese back. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it's uh, finally, I turned it to uh, Hausen's hands and we both satisfied with, with that. With the yeah, master Chinese mounters usually have a nice pet rock. Uh, <laughs> um, Arnold, do you want to say anything about that? I think we have time for one question. Make it brief. Um, uh, yes, Leo. Uh, I want to get back to the uh, the word, uh, the keyword gesture, um, and really this is for Sheng Hao. A question. I mean, gesture not only visually is you know the stroke, the brush, the ink, selection, expression, and always coming, coming back to the body of the artist. But before any of those, I mean, the, the first initial gesture really is, in this case, the selection, you know, what the artist has selected to work with, which in, in many ways is fundamental to the idea of a style. You need to make that initial choice. And what's really unique about this exhibition is there's two choices. One that the artist has made, his gesture, his choice of which work to choose, but also in this case, the choice of the, you know, the, the museum to one, to what they show the artist, <laughs> which is really what I want to ask Shanghao about. Uh, there is as much the gesture in this exhibition by the museum and by the curator as the artists themselves. And I would just like to ask Shang how, you know, how do you see your role as, you know, what is your gesture in this exhibition? Um, it's a gesture of openness and generosity. <laughs> <laughs> how do you express that in brush strokes? <laughs> uh, we wrote out the red carpet. Um, and uh, some artists stayed um, multiple weekends. Um, some artists like uh, Li Jing came and for a second visit and stayed for six weeks. <laughs> um, and uh, he would come in in the morning, look at our paintings, uh, stroll down Huntington Avenue to go back to his uh, apartment and studio that we rented for him and uh, paint the rest of the day away. And uh, he remembers those days being the most productive time of his life. And so the museum is really proud to be able to participate in the creation of contemporary Chinese art. And uh, not only activating its permanent collection, but also creating this impetus for uh, these works to be made. Uh, we must end our session now. We'll have, uh, throughout the day, uh, ample opportunity to raise similar questions, different questions, many more questions for uh, our other panelists. Um, uh, we have a 15-minute break, and uh, we'll start the next session. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>